Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, a production of catholicculture.org and under the patronage of St. John Henry Newman. Today's reading, Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 1, Chapters 19-24, through 24, by St. Francis de Sales, narrated by James T. Majewski. Chapter 19 How to Make a General Confession Such meditations as these, my child, will help you, and having made them, go on bravely in the spirit of humility to make your general confession. But I entreat you, be not troubled by any sort of fearfulness. The scorpion who stings us is venomous, but when his oil has been distilled, it is the best remedy for his bite. Even so, sin is shameful when we commit it, but when reduced to repentance and confession, it becomes salutary and honorable. Contrition and confession are in themselves so lovely and sweet-savored that they efface the ugliness and disperse the ill-savor of sin. Simon the leper called Magdalene a sinner, but our Lord turned the discourse to the perfume of her ointment and the greatness of her love. If we are really humble, my child, our sins will be infinitely displeasing to us, because they offend God. But it will be welcome and sweet to accuse ourselves thereof, because in so doing we honor God. And there is always somewhat soothing in fully telling the physician all details of our pain. When you come to your spiritual father, imagine yourself to be on Mount Calvary at the foot of the crucified Savior, whose precious blood is dropping freely to cleanse you from all your sin. Though it is not his actual blood, yet it is the merit of that outpoured blood that is sprinkled over his penitents as they kneel in confession. Be sure, then, that you open your heart fully and put away your sins by confessing them, for in proportion as they are put out, so will the precious merits of the Passion of Christ come in and fill you with blessings. Tell everything simply and with straightforwardness, and thoroughly satisfy your conscience in doing so. Then listen to the admonitions and counsels of God's minister, saying in your heart, Speak, for your servant hears. It is truly God to whom you hearken, for as much as he has said to his representatives, He who hears you, hears me. Then take the following protest as a summary of your contrition, having carefully studied and meditated upon it beforehand. Read it through with as earnest an intention as you can make. Chapter 20 a sincere protest made with the object of confirming the soul's resolution to serve God as a conclusion to its acts of penitence. I, the undersigned, in the presence of God and of all the company of heaven, having considered the infinite mercy of his heavenly goodness towards me, a most miserable, unworthy creature, whom he has created, preserved, sustained, delivered from so many dangers, and filled with so many blessings. Having above all considered the incomprehensible mercy and loving kindness with which this most good God has borne with me in my sinfulness, leading me so tenderly to repentance, and waiting so patiently for me till this present year of my life, notwithstanding all my ingratitude, disloyalty, and faithlessness, by which I have delayed turning to him and despising his grace have offended him anew, and further, remembering that in my baptism I was solemnly and happily dedicated to God as his child, and that in defiance of the profession then made in my name, I have so often miserably profaned my gifts, turning them against God's divine majesty. I, now coming to myself, prostrate in heart and soul before the throne of his justice, acknowledge and confess that I am duly accused and convicted of treason against his majesty and guilty of the death and passion of Jesus Christ, by reason of the sins I have committed, for which he died, bearing the reproach of the cross. 
so that I deserve nothing else save eternal damnation. But, turning to the throne of infinite mercy of this eternal God, detesting the sins of my past life with all my heart and all my strength, I humbly desire and ask grace, pardon, and mercy with entire absolution from my sin in virtue of the death and passion of that same Lord and Redeemer, on whom I lean as the only ground of my hope. I renew the sacred promise of faithfulness to God made in my name at my baptism, renouncing the devil, the world, and the flesh, abhorring their accursed suggestions, vanities, and lusts, now and for all eternity. And turning to a loving and pitiful God, I desire, intend, and deliberately resolve to serve and love Him now and eternally, devoting my mind and all its faculties, my soul and all its powers, my heart and all its affections, my body and all its senses, to His will. I resolve never to misuse any part of my being by opposing His divine will and sovereign majesty, to which I wholly immolate myself in intention vowing ever to be his loyal, obedient, and faithful servant without any change or recall. But if unhappily, through the promptings of the enemy or human infirmity, I should in any wise fail in this my resolution and dedication, I do most earnestly resolve by the grace of the Holy Spirit to rise up again so soon as I shall perceive my fall and turn anew without any delay to seek his divine mercy. This is my firm will and intention, my inviolable, irrevocable resolution, which I make and confirm without any reserve in the holy presence of God, in the sight of the church triumphant, and before the church militant, which is my mother, who accepts this my declaration, in the person of him who, as her representative, hears me make it. Be pleased, O eternal, all-powerful, and all-loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to confirm me in this my resolution and accept my sincere and willing offering. And inasmuch as you have been pleased to inspire me with the will to make it, give me also the necessary strength and grace to keep it. O God, you are my God, the God of my heart, my soul, and spirit. And as such I acknowledge and adore you, now and for all eternity. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. Chapter 21 Conclusion of this First Purification Having made this resolution, wait attentively and open the ears of your heart, that you may in spirit hear the absolution which the Lord of your soul sitting on the throne of his mercy, will speak in heaven before the saints and angels when his priest absolves you here below in his name. Be sure that all that company of blessed ones rejoice in your joy and sing a song of untold gladness, embracing you and accepting you as cleansed and sanctified. Of a truth, my child, this is a marvelous deed and a most blessed bargain for you, inasmuch as giving yourself to his divine majesty, you gain him and save yourself for eternal life. No more remains to do save to take the pen and heartily sign your protest and then hasten to the altar, where God on his side will sign and seal your absolution and his promise of paradise, giving himself to you in his sacrament as a sacred seal placed upon your renewed heart. And thus, dear child, your soul will be cleansed from sin and from all its affections. But for as much as these affections are easily rekindled, thanks to our infirmity and concupiscence, which may be mortified but which can never be altogether extinguished while we live, I will give you certain counsels by the practice of which you may henceforth avoid mortal sin and the affections pertaining thereto. And as these counsels will also help you to attain a yet more perfect purification, before giving them, I would say somewhat concerning that absolute perfection to which I seek to lead you. Chapter 22 The Necessity of Purging Away All Tendency to Venial Sins 
as daylight waxes, we, gazing into a mirror, see more plainly the soils and stains upon our face. And even so, as the interior light of the Holy Spirit enlightens our conscience, we see more distinctly the sins, inclinations, and imperfections that hinder our progress towards real devotion. And the selfsame light that shows us these blots and stains kindles in us the desire to be cleansed and purged therefrom. You will find then, my child, that besides the mortal sins and their affections from which your soul has already been purged, you are beset by various inclinations and tendencies to venial sin. Mind, I do not say you will find venial sins, but the inclination and tendency to them. Now, one is quite different from the other. We can never be altogether free from venial sin, at least not until after a very long persistence in this purity. But we can be without any affection for venial sin. It is altogether one thing to have said something unimportant not strictly true, out of carelessness or liveliness, and quite a different matter to take pleasure in lying and in the habitual practice thereof. But I tell you that you must purify your soul from all inclination to venial sin. That is to say, you must not voluntarily retain any deliberate intention of permitting yourself to commit any venial sin whatever. It would be most unworthy consciously to admit anything so displeasing to God as the will to offend Him in any wise. Venial sin, however small, is displeasing to God, although it be not so displeasing as the greater sins that involve eternal condemnation. And if venial sin is displeasing to Him, any clinging that we tolerate to mortal sin is nothing less than a resolution to offend His divine majesty. Is it really possible that a rightly disposed soul can not only offend God, but take pleasure therein? These inclinations, my child, are in direct opposition to devotion, as inclinations to mortal sin are to love. They weaken the mental power, hinder divine consolations, and open the door to temptations. And although they may not destroy the soul, at least they bring on very serious disease. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off an evil odor, says the wise man. He means that the flies that settle upon and taste of the ointment only damage it temporarily, leaving the mass intact. But if they fall into it and die there, they spoil and corrupt it. Even so, venial sins that pass over a devout soul without being harbored do not permanently injure it, but if such sins are fostered and cherished, they destroy the sweet savor of that soul, that is to say, its devotion. The spider cannot kill bees, but it can spoil their honey, and so encumber their combs with its webs in course of time as to hinder the bees materially. Just so, though venial sins may not lose the soul, they will spoil its devotion, and so burden its faculties with bad habits and evil inclinations as to deprive it of all that cheerful readiness that is the very essence of true devotion. That is to say, if they are harbored in the conscience by delight taken therein. A trifling inaccuracy, a little hastiness in word or action, some small excess in mirth, in dress, in gaiety, may not be very important if these are forthwith heated and swept out as spiritual cobwebs. But if they are permitted to linger in the heart, or, worse still, if we take pleasure in them and indulge them, our honey will soon be spoiled, and the hive of our conscience will be burdened and damaged. But I ask again, how can a generous heart take delight in anything it knows to be displeasing to its God, or wish to do what offends Him? Chapter 23 It is necessary to put away all inclination for useless and dangerous things. Sports, balls, plays, festivities, pomps are not in themselves evil, but rather indifferent matters capable of being used for good or ill. But nevertheless, they are dangerous, 
and it is still more dangerous to take great delight in them. Therefore, my child, I say that although it is lawful to amuse yourself, to dance, dress, feast, and see seemly plays, at the same time, if you are much addicted to these things, they will hinder your devotion and become extremely hurtful and dangerous to you. The harm lies not in doing them, but in the degree to which you care for them. It is a pity to sow the seed of vain and foolish tastes in the soil of your heart, taking up the place of better things and hindering the soul from cultivating good dispositions. It was thus that the Nazarites of old abstained not merely from all intoxicating liquors, but from grapes fresh or dried, and from vinegar, not because these were intoxicating, but because they might excite the desire for fermented liquors. Just so. While I do not forbid the use of these dangerous pleasures, I say that you cannot take an excessive delight in them without their telling upon your devotion. When the stag has waxed fat, he hides himself amid the thicket, conscious that his fleetness is impaired should he be in need to fly. And so the human heart that is burdened with useless, superfluous, dangerous clingings becomes incapacitated for that earnest following after God that is the true life of devotion. No one blames children for running after butterflies, because they are children. But is it not ridiculous and pitiful to see full-grown men eager about such worthless trifles as the worldly amusements before named, which are likely to throw them off their balance and disturb their spiritual life? Therefore, dear child, I would have you cleanse your heart from all such tastes, Remembering that while the acts themselves are not necessarily incompatible with a devout life, all delight in them must be harmful. Chapter 24 All Evil Inclinations Must Be Purged Away Furthermore, my child, we have certain natural inclinations, which are not, strictly speaking, either mortal or venial sins, but rather imperfections and the acts in which they take shape, failings and deficiencies. Thus St. Jerome says that St. Paula had so strong a tendency to excessive sorrow that when she lost her husband and children, she nearly died of grief. That was not a sin, but an imperfection, since it did not depend upon her wish and will. Some people are naturally easy, some oppositious. Some are indisposed to accept other men's opinions, some naturally disposed to be cross, some to be affectionate. In short, there is hardly anyone in whom some such imperfections do not exist. Now, although they be natural and instinctive in each person, they may be remedied and corrected, or even eradicated, by cultivating the reverse disposition. And this, my child, must be done. Gardeners have found how to make the bitter almond tree bear sweet fruit by grafting the juice of the latter upon it. Why should we not purge out our perverse dispositions and infuse such as are good? There is no disposition so good but it may be made bad by reason of vicious habits, and neither is there any natural disposition so perverse but that it may be conquered and overcome by God's grace primarily and then by our earnest, diligent endeavor. I shall therefore now proceed to give you counsels and suggest practices by which you may purify your soul from all dangerous affections and imperfections and from all tendencies to venial sin, thereby strengthening yourself more and more against mortal sin. May God give you grace to use them. This has been Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 1, Chapters 19 through 24, by St. Francis de Sales, narrated by James T. Majewski, copyright 2015 by Ignatius Press and Augustine Institute, production copyright 2022 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is brought to you by CatholicCulture.org and made possible by listener support. To donate, 
please visit catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. That's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio.